Welcome, everyone. Good evening. I'm Adam Stern, Executive Director of Actera. Uh, this is the third in our fall series. We had Steve Wesley, the former controller of California, and then uh, just a couple of weeks ago, Kat Taylor, the founder and CEO of Beneficial State Bank in Oakland. Uh, I'm delighted to have Carl Hope with us this evening. He's an old friend and truly one of the great leaders of the American environmental movement. Um, he worked for the Sierra Club for 30 years, 18 of which he was executive director. It's one of the most complex and influential organizations our country has ever had. His roots go back, of course, to John Muir, and Carl did it with uh, great distinction and leadership. And one of the things that always impressed me is he, he seemed to know where the pressure points were to make a difference, and I think he's still doing that in his work his work now. He currently is principal advisor at Inside Street Strategies, a firm which focuses on the links between sustainability and economic development, and he ser serves as senior climate advisor to Michael Bloomberg and several of his businesses. He was founder of the Blue Green Alliance, an uh, organization some of you may know about, which has really been pivotal in drawing the connection between environmental groups and labor organizations, one of the really central strategies of broadening the appeal and influence of the environmental movement. He also has been on the board of America Votes and the California League of Conservation Voters and the National Clean Air Coalition. He writes regularly for Huffington Post. I recommend you go and look up Carl on HuffPost and you'll see a lot of nice uh, pieces which uh, spread his message widely. Uh, we're just delighted to have him, and his book, which he's going to talk about this evening, is uh, something I highly recommend. In this time when many of us are uh, can, can fall into some level of discouragement, Carl's a beacon of hope. Please welcome Carl to Actera. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Adam. Uh, first, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you all for coming out on what is a remarkably nice California evening, so you had better things to do, and I appreciate you chose not to do them. Um, I want to start out a little bit by saying, making a point, I know a number of you have seen this. This is the American edition of the book I wrote with Mike Bloomberg. Those of you who haven't seen it, you have an opportunity to see it later this evening, and I hope some of you at least will take advantage. But that's the American edition. Who here is reasonably familiar with modern China, because I am not. Somebody here. OK. So this is the Chinese edition of the book. Is that Shanghai, or is that some other city? Beijing. That's Beijing. OK. So in the American edition, we have Central Park. Do you know the name of this park? <laughs> Too far away. OK, well, you can come and tell me later, because this is the Chinese edition. Now, what's interesting about the fact that I have these two versions of the book, and I will note that Chinese is evidently a compressed language. This is a much smaller, it actually. <laughs> Pictograms do that for you. Uh, is that if you had said a decade ago that in the fall of 2017, there would be a book published by a New York finance community billionaire and the former executive director of the Sierra Club, which would then be reprinted by the government of China. And the topic would have been how climate is a good thing for all of us to solve because it's going to make us richer, healthier, and safer, you would not have gotten a respectful hearing. <laughs> so the world has changed. And I want to be clear the world has not changed because Mike and I wrote a book. Mike and I wrote a book because the world has changed. And that's the most important lesson that I want to leave you with. We all carry around in our heads 10-year-old pictures of how the world works. And many of us, most of you in this room, I'm sure, routinely read in the media 
individual snippets and individual data points that tell you that actually the picture you're carrying around in your head isn't true anymore. It was true when you learned it. It wasn't fake news when you learned it. But the world has moved, when the world moves past us, we change the numbers. Lots of us can tell you numbers and you say, well, wait a minute, but does that, how do you think this thing works? And I then tell you how I think it works and somebody say, yeah, but that's not what the numbers you just told me say. So I want to start out with the idea that if we're really going to solve this conundrum of the fact that we have already, we have already destabilized a 10,000 year old climate regime that was actually quite gentle. 10,000 years, we've had a rather gentle climate. And human civilization doesn't actually have any experience of a normally brutal climate. Remember, 10,000 years ago, if you went to Chicago, you were a mile under ice. So we've had a good ride from what climatologists call the Holocene equilibrium. And we've now like decided to see if we can push it over the edge, which wasn't terribly clever of us. But, but the fact is the task of getting it back into stability is actually all good news. You do not need to sacrifice anything. You might need to be smarter. You not need do not need to give up prosperity. You might have to have a slightly smaller closet with clothes that last a little bit longer. And you can actually even have some vices. I happen to eat too much shrimp, full confession. I try to make up with it for it in other ways, and we each have that option. We can have a few little private vices, things that aren't terribly good, and we understand they're not terribly good. So now I'm going to go and try to explain why Mike and I think that the way we think about climate and the way we feel about climate are the two things that are getting in the way of solving climate. Wait, pause. Let me ask a question. How many of you think that, yeah, there's a bunch of other stuff, but really What's messing up the climate is all those fossil fuels we're burning. How many of you sort of think that's a true statement? OK. That's about what I expected. First slide. OK, fossil fuels are the orange slice. 31% of human impact on the climate is fossil fuels. 31% less than a third. 27% is methane. 15% is forestry. 17% is black carbon, most of which comes from poor people who don't have clean fuel to cook in their kitchens. So black carbon plus forestry, which are mostly about poverty, are a bigger source of climate disruption than fossil fuels, which is mostly about wealth. So we don't even understand the problem. Now let's look at why Mike and I think this is going to be getting this all fixed. It's going to be good news. Let me sort of explain what Mike and I concluded. If you went to Stanford Hospital and you were feeling really crappy and Stanford Hospital said, you, you have a fever, you would say, yeah, and what do I have? You would not consider having a fever to be an adequate diagnosis. A fever is a symptom. It's not a disease. It could be many things. Once upon a time, it could have been smallpox. No longer. It can be something very innocuous. It could be something pretty scary. But you want to know what caused the fever. Climate disruption is not a disease. It's a symptom of a bunch of diseases. And these diseases, each one of these little wedges here, has a source. Yes? What, by the way, is a halocarbon? A halocarbon is 
uh, a mixture of halogens, which are uh, chlorine, chlorine. chlorine, fluorine, and bromine, with a carbon. So CFCs were halocarbons. DDT was a halocarbon. HFCs, which are probably, if you buy, drive a reasonably new car, you have an HFC in your refrigeration system. That's a halocarbon. And they turn out, they're the things that destroy the ozone layer. And a new version of them is disrupting climate. So these are actually probably the worst inventions in human history. Well, maybe the gun. The gun might be pretty bad. <laughs> but these are pretty bad. I'm going to start with the 15% that is forestry and land use. Half of the timber cut in the tropics is cut at gunpoint or at bribe point illegally. The problem of deforestation is not that you eat too much beef. The problem with deforestation is not that you consume too much wood. The problem with deforestation is stolen beef will always be cheaper than honestly produced beef, and stolen wood will always be cheaper than honestly produced beef. The tropical timber trade is a racket. We've had global rackets before. The slave trade was a racket, and we had to suppress it. We need to suppress illegal logging. And that would actually dramatically improve incomes in the two major countries where this happens, which are Brazil and Indonesia plus a little bit the Congo, it would make people in the Congo and Brazil richer, and it would make the climate safer, and it would make the environment better. So Mike and I look at that and we say, that is a win-win for everybody except the timber mafia. Right now, the timber mafia run the show because we're not paying enough attention to it. We don't ask when we walk into Walmart, where did this, where did this thing come from? How did it get here? Was it really, the person who sold it really own it? 50% the odds are they didn't, they stole it. Next. 27% methane, biggest single source of methane is the oil and gas industry. Uh, we allow the oil industry in North Dakota to drill oil wells, which also produce a huge amount of perfectly useful natural gas, the natural gas you use to heat your house. And we let them just sort of like put it into a primitive, inefficient flare so that North Dakota from space is as bright as Paris. And we don't make them pay for the fact that they took this fossil fuel that they extracted from somebody's land. They don't have to pay the owner of the land for that. And you may not know this. Uh, is anybody here from San Carlos? I want to be thoughtful and sensitive. Because there was a real tragedy in San Carlos a few years ago. One of the things people don't understand is that the gas that was leaking from that PG&E pipeline in San Carlos was, be was it San Bruno? I'm sorry. You're right. Thank you. I apologize. No, no, that's not, that's not good enough. Uh, that natural gas was being billed, the natural gas that was leaking was being billed to the homeowners of San Bruno. You pay for the gas you don't get. So in fact, the people who ship it to you have absolutely no incentive to stop it from leaking because they get paid for it anyway, even if they don't deliver it. Because that's the way utility regulation works. So Mike and I believe that actually saying, wait a minute, you can only charge me for what I get. If I don't get it, I'm not going to pay for it. And if that happened, that methane number would get a lot smaller. So Mike and I think that would actually be pretty good news for utility customers, and it would definitely be good news for the climate. Um, <laughs> nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide, yes? Now, most of it is not from fracking, but, but, I mean, first of all, a lot of it is from things other than oil and gas, but I can only talk about so many examples. Less than half of the methane in the oil and gas industry comes from fracking, because most of our oil and gas is not actually yet produced by fracking. Fracking is not the source of the problem. It's our dependence on oil and gas. And it's the fact that we allow the oil and gas industry just to, like, 
belch into the atmosphere without regulation. Uh, nitrous oxide comes off agricultural lands. It's the result of putting too much fertilizer on farmland. Why do farmers put so much fertilizer on farmland? Well, it turns out we pay them a lot to grow corn. And corn needs a lot of nitrogen. Now, we don't need this corn. We do not eat this corn. We turn this corn into an inferior and unhealthy form of sugar. But as long as we're paying about $80 billion a year to American corn farmers to grow as much corn as they possibly can, whether or not we need it, they will use a lot of nitrogen. So if we actually just said, you know something? We're going to pay farmers $80 billion a year. Let's be realistic. Let's say we have to pay them, or we want to pay them. Why don't we pay them to grow something we want instead of something we don't need? For example, farmers in the Corn Belt could easily start managing their land with no fertilizer. And if they did that, every year an average acre would take about five tons of carbon out of the atmosphere in a gaseous form where it's bad and put it into the soil in a solid form where it actually stores water. So we could actually make America's farmers the biggest solution to climate change in the entire country by spending the same amount of money to pay them to do something we need them to do, which is store carbon and water, instead of something we don't need them to do, which is to produce corn syrup. Next. Uh, hollow carbon, somebody asked about it. This is what's in your refrigerator. Right now it's 5%. If you had taken the trend lines a few years ago and said, what's going to happen, it would have been 15 or 20 percent. Because we were in the process of replacing the refrigerants in your air conditioner, your refrigerator, and your auto air conditioner with these new chemicals called HFCs, which were, I mean, if a doctor no character had designed a chemical to destroy the climate, these chemicals would have been what he would have come up with. But fortunately, at the end of the Obama administration, the world agreed at Kigali, uh, Uganda, to actually phase these out. So this part of the slice is most likely going to go away. It'll be the first climate pollutant we actually get rid of. Next. OK. This is black carbon, which comes off of women in Africa burning charcoal, women in India burning cow dung, Women in Indonesia burning biomass of various kinds. Women in Mexico building mesquite shrub. And by the way, something like 10% of the women who have to cook on these kinds of fuels die of it. So it's really one of the major causes of death in these villages. Now. We don't, well, most of us don't. We try, yeah, we have our barbecues, and yes, we have a few wood burning stoves left. But basically, we cook on clean stuff. If you go back to that methane example, all that methane that's being flared could be turned into cooking fuel for poor women. A lot of it's being flared in places like Nigeria and Angola. So, Solving the methane problem would also give us the feedstock to solve the black carbon problem. And both of those things would make people, Mike's and my favorite mantra, we have to make people richer, we have to make people healthier, we have to make people safer. And if we do those things and we also solve the climate problem, what's not to like? Okay, now we can. So let's talk a little bit about uh, why Mike and I are optimistic. You can turn this, I think we, oh, that. That's, oh, fossil fuels. Yes, we actually, I suppose, have to pay attention to fossil fuels. Um, this one is a lot smaller today than it was when we published the book in April. And that's because over the past 15 years, people, many of them living within a 30-mile radius of this library, 
uh, developed new technologies to generate electricity, which have two remarkable qualities. One, they don't emit carbon dioxide at all. Two, once you put them up, they're effectively free. Once you put a solar panel on your roof or a wind panel on your farm, a wind turbine on your farm, you're really not buying fuel at all. For 20 years, you're going to be cranking out electrons, and it won't cost you much at all. And it turns out that the economics of doing that are astonishing. We're not understood by industry. So we are now undergoing a revolution in our electricity sector in which we are replacing high carbon natural gas or coal-fired power plants with zero carbon and free, once you build it, electrons from wind and solar. Uh, and it's happening at a speed, I'll just give you a couple of examples. I have lots of examples that are funny, but the one I think is actually the most revealing is in eastern Kentucky, there is a museum of coal mining. The Museum of Coal Mining, about six months ago, went out and looked for the cheapest electricity to keep the lights on during the day when the Museum of Coal Mining has visitors. And they decided that the cheapest electrons they could get were from the sun. So the Museum of Coal Mining in eastern Kentucky no longer burns, uses coal-fired electrons. It uses solar electrons. And they save $10,000 a year by making the conversion. Uh, Another example, uh, there is a railroad, some of you are probably from the east, so you'll remember this, there used to be the Baltimore and Ohio and the Chesapeake and Ohio, and then they all merged into a railroad called the CSX. And the CSX is a railroad whose fundamental historical purpose was to call coal. And 47% of its revenue freight miles, the stuff it carries today, 47% is coal, and the CEO of CSX announced a month ago that he would no longer replace coal cars. If a coal car wears out on the CSX railroad, it's not going to be replaced because he knows that coal is going away. He said, it's not going away in three years. But I don't buy coal cars for three years. I buy coal cars for 20 years. And if I don't know that there's going to be a market for that coal 20 years from now, I'm not buying coal cars. So that is going away. And there's some people in this room who've been working on the next big chunk of fossil fuels, which is gasoline, diesel fuel. It's what's in your car and your truck. And, and again, when Mike and I published the book in April, we couldn't have said this, but I can now say that it, it looked in April like cleaning up cars and trucks would take about 20 years. It's now going to take maybe 10, maybe 15. But we've already, in four months, we've gained five years on the retirement of another big chunk of that orange slice, which is the slice we all think about. It's the slice the media all writes about. We think it's all about fossil fuels. The main purpose of this graph is to remind you it's not all about fossil fuels. It's about everything. It's about agriculture. It's about refrigeration. It's about cooking. It's about pollution. The climate problem has many failures, but solving each one of them will make you richer. So now let's talk a little bit about why this is hard. I just told you why it's easy. And it's hard for three reasons. The first reason is that what's going to solve this problem is innovation. If I knew how fast the global economy was going to change. I can tell you with reasonable certainty how much, how fast we were going to solve the climate problem. Because we are no longer building stuff that makes this problem worse. Basically, if we build a new factory, it's going to be cleaner than the old factory. If somebody adds 20 million new vehicles to the road, they're not going to be powered with diesel or gasoline. But 
when you innovate, well, at some point in, in 1916, there were eight horses for every automobile in the Thanksgiving Day Parade on Fifth Avenue. By 1920, four years later, there was only one horse left. So when a really fast revolution like that takes place, and 1920 incidentally, because a lot of American horses were in agriculture, and so we didn't have, you know, we didn't have tractors in 1916. That happened after 1920. 1920 was the year we had peak horse in the United States. And in 1920, in a much, much smaller American economy, there were 118,000 people making harnesses. And in 1928, there were none. So we went through a huge transition where hundreds of thousands of people, had a, they were skilled workers. This was a highly skilled profession. It was a very well paid profession. Being a harness maker was a good job in 1920, and those good jobs went away. <laughs> now, the President of the United States during the time when they mostly went away, from 1923 to 1928, was a very conservative Republican named Calvin Coolidge, who you probably don't think of as being terribly enlightened when you, you, don't, you don't learn anything good about Calvin Coolidge in history books, at least I didn't. But confronted with the revolution that was sweeping the American landscape in 1923 when he became president, Calvin Coolidge did not decide to bail out the harness makers by making it hard for Henry Ford to sell Model T's and for Dearborn to begin selling tractors. He looked around and he said, what's the next new big thing? And the next new big thing in 1923 was airplanes. And Calvin Coolidge created airmail. And the reason for creating airmail was so the United States could have commercial aviation. Commercial aviation was entirely lubricated as a business proposition by the fact that the early airlines United being one of the ones that's less than American, but also TWA and all the others. All those early airlines got really fat, juicy airmail contracts from the federal government. And that's what enabled the United States to lead the aviation revolution. Now, fortunately, between 1923 and 1928, we had a very strong economy. So that the harness makers I mentioned, who did lose their jobs by 1928, were able to get new kinds of jobs because we were creating a lot of new kinds of jobs. Then in 1929, as we all know, we stopped creating new kinds of jobs and there was an enormous amount of misery. And during the 1930s, for the first five years of the 1930s, there wasn't much innovation in the American economy because nobody wanted anything to change because if anything changed, People would be thrown out of work, and there were no other jobs. So the second key thing we have to understand is we can't use the model of 1930 to 1935, because that was a period of time in which we tried to freeze innovation in the American And Franklin Roosevelt tried to freeze innovation in the American economy between the first three years of Israel, because we didn't know what to do with the people who would lose. We didn't know how to cope with the fact there would be people who lost. And they were good people. They were talented people. They were skilled people. And in 1935, Franklin Roosevelt shifted track. And he decided that we were going to say, OK, maybe you don't have a job as a harness maker. You can still have a pension. You can have something called Social Security. He said to farmers in 1935, and my father actually worked on this, so this is sort of dinner table conversation from my youth. 1935, 85% of rural Americans didn't have electricity. The utilities were absolutely not interested in giving rural Americans electricity because they thought rural Americans wouldn't, would have to borrow money because it's capital intensive, and they wouldn't pay it back. 
Roosevelt, 1935, made a key decision. He simply said, I think American farmers are hardworking people. I think electricity is a terrific technology. I think American farmers will repay their loans. I'm going to give them all loans. And he created the REA. And we, in eight years, we electrified 95% of rural America. So from 1935 to 1939, we resumed the pathway of innovation. But we did so by giving people insurance. We did so by giving people credit. And we need, once again, to start investing in the future here in the United States. We need to let cities, if a city builds a transit system, the economy of that city is going to make money. But right now, we don't necessarily let the city collect the money because they may not be able to raise the property taxes, thanks to Proposition 13, on the buildings right next to the transit stop. So we need to get back into the business of letting those who make money from innovation share a portion of it, not all of it, but a portion of the money they make from innovation with the people who are left behind from innovation. Because actually, in the modern world, Yes, having your house bound down by fire is a risk, but the much bigger risk is progress. Progress for most of us is a risk. Because we might not be in the right place at the right time. We could be left behind. We don't want all of us to be out there trying to slow down progress. At least I don't. So I think we need, second of all, to move into a world in which we understand insurance in a very, very different way. And the third thing we need to understand is, as Adam Smith pointed out, you have to make businessmen work hard for a profit, or they'll just steal the money. <laughs> they'll create a monopoly. They'll get a special payoff from the government. They'll do a whole variety of things. And it's human. I'm not being critical. It's just what people do. People would rather get money working less hard than more hard. So we need to pay attention to who we're paying off. And one of the striking things is that the latest proposal from the Trump administration, which is, well, it's nominally a conservative Republican administration. I suspect there are probably a number of people in this room who used to be Republicans, and probably some of you aren't anymore, because your party has changed, or what was then your party has changed. But Donald Trump's latest proposal is the following that in a certain number of states, mainly in the Midwest, not including most of the states Trump carried, utility ratepayers and customers should have to pay to keep open no longer economically viable coal power plants and nuclear power plants at whatever price he literally hasn't set a ceiling on how much you would have to pay. You would simply have to say to the people who own those power plants, you get to make money on this power plant, even if it never generates a single electron, as long as you keep a stack of coal or a pile of uranium fuel sitting there. Now, he is doing this quite clearly because one of his campaign contributors is about to go bankrupt if he doesn't do that. And Rick Perry, who is the Secretary of Energy, who's been given the task of selling this proposal, is from Texas. And he made sure when he wrote it, it does not apply to Texas. <laughs> Ratepayers in Texas will not have to do this. Ratepayers in Ohio and Indiana and Michigan will. And the reason that Donald Trump is doing this is because any kind of vaguely market system will not keep open these old coal plants and these, at the end of their lifetime, nuclear plants. And nobody's going to replace them with new coal plants and new nuclear plants. So Mr. Murray, who runs Murray Coal and is the campaign contributor who asked for this favor, won't have any place to sell his coal because actually there's no market for coal. There won't be a market for coal in eastern Ohio in five years. So Donald Trump is trying to rescue coal. So those are the three principles that we have to pay attention to. One, innovate fast. Two, insure us all so that we can tolerate fast innovation, because otherwise we won't be able to stand it. We will lose too much. We'll be too insecure. 
And three, look for the payoff. Because what will happen to slow these two things down is incumbents who have a lot of money invested in something whose time has come and gone will try to get us to pay them forever. That's just the way human beings are. Thank you very much. Now I have, I have one hard rule about questions and answers, which is if anybody's going to ask me a rude question or a tough question, I'll call on them first. So if anybody thinks they have a rude question, raise your hand. <laughs> well, that's a bad way to this. Oh, yeah, OK, somebody back there. Good, OK. Good. Thank you, sir. Hi, I'm a retiree, and I'm working with my pension board to uh, get them to uh, divest from fossil fuels. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm meeting with a couple of the trustees tomorrow. I was wondering about your position or Mayor Bloomberg's position on divestment. Well, whether, uh, okay, let me make a distinction. <laughs> it depends on who you are. If you're a day trader and you're only interested in your bottom line, you probably should, if you're good at it, stick around with fossil fuels, a lot of volatility, your pension fund, you ought to ask your pension advisors the following question. What kind of a position did we have in coal and coal utility stocks five years ago? And what is that position worth today? 95% loss in market value in the strongest stock market in 30 years. No industry in human history has ever lost the kind of money that the coal industry lost in the last five years in its market cap in a strong market. And you say, okay, so, oh, we're not doing coal anymore. We're going to do oil. Well, go back to the summer of 2014, and if you look, there's a big conference where the oil patch gathers to be made to feel good. Because when they're made to feel good, they actually do throw a pretty good party. Uh, it's held in Houston. It's run by a firm called IHS, which is headed by Dan Jurgen. And IHS announced in July of 2014, when they had this conference, as they do every year, that $100, which was the price of crude oil at that point, was $110, $100 is the new floor for oil prices. It's the new $20. Three months later, the bottom fell out of the oil market. And they all celebrated on the 1st of November when oil crept to $60. Uh, there's been a loss of market value by the oil industry, about 13%. It's the largest disruption, again, in a strong economy. You say, which industry has lost the largest share of market cap in human history? And it is what the oil industry has lost in the last five years. So I would say, unless you have a pretty good argument for why you think we're about to have a huge new boom in fossil fuels, I don't want my pension to be the last one out the door. And pension funds can't exit quickly. That's the thing. If you're a day trader, you can exit quickly. But you, pension funds cannot exit quickly. Yes? So just to pick up on that, could you argue that given the Trump administration, Administrator Pruitt, that the solar and renewable energy markets are going to be hammered so much from the administration that maybe gold and coal and gas can come back because renewables shut out. Well, again, if you're a day trader, you could argue that solar is going to get hammered perhaps by this tariff deal. So okay, if I'm, a, if I'm somebody who's trying to make money on short-term volatility, I can see there might be weeks when I would bet against solar. Wind's not going to be affected by that. And solar's not going to be affected long term, but it could have a six-month, eight-month period. 
The problem is, if that happens, uh, fossil fuels aren't going to come back. Natural gas is going to take up the slack. <laughs> not oil and not coal. So there really is no upside to the kinds of investments that he's worried about because, in fact, these are expensive fuels. I mean, yesterday, uh, a really well-established, uh, M- Missouri has actually historically been the state with the cheapest coal power because that had no pollution regulation, relatively good access to Wyoming coal, which doesn't have to go that far to get to St. Louis. It was the headquarters of Arch Coal and uh, Peabody. And they had a lot of old, fully amortized coal plants. So they would generate seven cents a kilowatt hour electricity, which they would sell into other states. You all are paying, you know, 19 to 23 cents a kilowatt hour if you haven't looked at your bill lately. So seven cents look pretty good. Wind power in southern Missouri, new wind power, brand new wind power, 20 year power purchase agreements, no inflation hedge, you're guaranteed it'll never cost you more than this, 3.4 cents a kilowatt hour. This is the cheapest electricity the world has ever known. And there's more and more of it, and it's getting cheaper and cheaper. It's just going to run over whatever Donald Trump tries to do. Okay, back there in the back row. Could you go back to your pie chart? We don't have to put it up, but I'm curious about the roadmap to implementing that. And I'll say we need to read your book. I'm sure it's a lot of it's in there. But what, what would you say is the roadmap, and how might we as individuals fit into making that happen? There's no roadmap because we're not driving a single car. So there are a lot of opportunities. And the, the, every one of you has, unless you're really a hermit who only interacts with other human beings when you come out to read about my fascinating book, Unless that's true, you have an amazing number of opportunities. You have agency. You have power. I'll give you an example. Anheuser-Busch, Budweiser, is one of the corporations, and it was one of the first corporations, that committed that it is going to get 100% of its electricity from renewable electricity. And when I saw that, I sort of scratched my head. We often think that companies do these kinds of things for their customers. I have a hard time imagining any group of people sitting around a bar drinking Bud talking about where the electricity that was used to make the Bud came from. I don't even think about electricity being involved. I mean, I know, as a matter of fact, it takes a lot of electricity to make beer, but I don't think about that when I drink beer. And I don't think the average Bud customer does so either. So I was trying, I scratched my head. So I asked them. They said, look, we want to hire the smartest kids. We can't hire the smartest kids if we don't have a good story to tell about climate. So I now, when I go around and I speak to student groups, and students say to me, what can I do? And you know, and, and they want me to say something like, oh, get the right hoodie. And I say, The next time you have a job interview, be really tough on what they're doing about climate. And even if you don't get the job, you will have changed the world. So we each have, many of us have children in schools. And we can change those school districts. Many of us have jobs. We can harass our employers. All of us, almost all of us, can vote. And even if you can't vote, you can still show up at a hearing and make your city council listen to you and say, I don't want my power coming from dirty power plants and the city next door has already gone all renewable. Why can't we? Obviously, most of us, again, couldn't try to replace that man in the White House, but you're going to have to wait three years to do that. So in the meanwhile, I wouldn't wait. Figure out some human connection you have, some connection you have with an institution and go and make it be a better place. Because if you read the book, you'll be able to do so with the convincing argument that the bottom line is going to be fatter, the kids are going to learn more, the mayor's more likely to get reelected, 
Those are things that actually motivate people. Don't try to get people to make sacrifices. I would really strongly, in the climate context, now if you have to make a sacrifice for your grandmother or your son, yes, make that sacrifice. But if you have to make a sacrifice for the climate, find a better way to fix the climate. You don't have to make a sacrifice for the climate. And you don't have to advocate sacrifice. Yes. OK, you were actually, I think, up first, and then you, and then you. All right. Yeah. I don't have the microphone, so I can't speed it up. I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Cole. Uh, you mapped out a, uh, I don't remember what word map. You uh, laid out a good formula, it looks like, about things can change. It looks like it's the power of citizens and individual actions can make an effect. Um, uh, so Social Security is for people who are a certain age, usually. Uh, but for younger people, if there's still some fear there, you mentioned that you have some, some form of insurance. So maybe some income insurance um, to help moderate any risks that people might Well, have. the first thing we should do, Thank you. the first thing we should do is, I mean, I, here I disagree with Bernie Sanders. I don't think college should be free. I think parents should contribute as they can, and that depends on their income, to their children's college education. The rest of it, you should be able to borrow, but you should pay it back based on what you earn. So if you happen to go to college, and let's imagine that uh, some amazing new form of biotechnology becomes the biggest, hottest thing in whatever the replacement for Silicon Valley is in 20 years, and you go to college and you get a degree in that field, that form of engineering, and you make $40 billion, you ought to pay a really hefty sum back for your college education. If you go out and you decide you want to be a nurse in a hospice, you're giving back to society in other ways, and you shouldn't be expected to pay the same amount of money on your student loan. So we should, first of all, make education available to everybody, but we shouldn't make it free. We should make it available. The second thing we should do is we should say, OK, if you go to work for a company, every year you work in that company, you ought to earn a severance package. Every year. It shouldn't be capped. Most sever Many firms don't give severance packages. And most of those who do cap them. But if you work for 18 years for a company, you should have more of a stake in that company's prosperity than if you work nine years, roughly twice as much. That means you ought to have a severance package that's twice as big. So that when the company comes to lay people off, they won't be incented to lay off the worker who's been there the longest. They'll be incented to lay off the worker who's got the least stake in it and therefore has the most opportunity to find a new opportunity. So we need to construct a system that's designed to create the right incentives. And let me assure you, the bankers know how to do this. They do know how. This is not an intellectual problem. This is a problem that they actually deliberately design the incentives in a way that, from the point of view of my values, from the point of view of what we're talking about here, is perverse. So we need to get rid of the perverse incentives and replace them with generative incentives. And we know how to do it. We do know how to do it. Over here, there was somebody. Yeah, there's she. Hi. Thank you. Um, going back to the pie chart, when I see uh, methane, I think of landfills and I think of um, pollution around our waste system. So my first question is, where, where does our waste system, um, where is it placed in that pie chart? And second, why isn't our waste system more talked about when talking about climate change and pollution, atmospheric and soil, all that? Okay, well, I'll answer your second question first, which is, the climate scientists, I think, this is a hypothesis. I'm not sure this is true. I want to flag the fact that I don't know this. But the way they behave suggests to me that they kind of implicitly said the big problem that's going to be hard to get rid of is fossil fuels. So we're just going to talk about fossil fuels. We're not going to talk about the rest. They, they knew about those charts are from them. I didn't make those charts up. Those are their charts. 
And the waste system was like, oh, surely it'll be easy to fix the waste system. Well, it turns out if you don't talk about it, nobody knows it needs to be fixed except you. And it does need to be fixed. One of the major, it was an inadvertent blunder. I was part of it. The environmental movement got people to recycle glass. That was a dumb idea. Glass recycled is basically, it's just, it's sand. And melting glass and melting sand take about the same amount of electricity. So it takes almost as much energy to produce a bottle from a recycled bottle as it does from just sand. And when you put a bottle in a landfill, nothing happens. It's just a rock, just a rock in a landfill. When you put garbage in a landfill, you take something that was actually perfectly prepared to become part of the solution to climate change by becoming soil carbon, and you turn it into methane. A sanitary landfill is a perverse device for making household garbage a lethal chemical. And we need to keep our garbage out of landfills. And we should have been recycling garbage, not glass. And we have an opportunity to fix that now. And that's exactly where it fits in that chart. And it's big. And it's a huge thing that we need to do. Some cities are doing it already. San Francisco is. But I have to tell you, we've all been inculcated for many, many years to think that garbage is what we don't separate. That garbage is what we throw into the trash. So we've actually got a huge... We need to get into the schools and really educate the next generation of kids that when your mom throws a banana peel in with the beer bottles, that's not a good thing. Yes, and then I'll, I was ignoring this side and I apologize. I have a bias to the left side of the spectrum. <laughs> uh, you seem to encourage contentious questions, so I hope I do. you'll find this challenging uh, but not disrespectful. I might have missed it, but I don't think anywhere in your presentation really talked about putting a global uh, price on, on carbon and carbon equivalents. Okay. Um, so I'd really like to know, do you think that's unimportant, unnecessary, or just something you don't care to talk about for other reasons? Uh, well, actually, none of the above, but that's a good question. Um, Mike and I are both in favor of carbon taxes. But we're in favor of carbon taxes because we think they're good ways to fund government. We're not convinced they're actually going to make that much of a difference in the climate picture because if you levy, for example, if you look at the amount of the problem that is illegal forest cutting, a carbon tax is not going to fix that. If you look at HFCs, a carbon tax is not going to fix that. Yes? Okay, but if, 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 if wood is logged illegally and arrives at the dock in the United States with a, bill of, wait, with a bill of lading that says it was logged legally and it paid its taxes because somebody bribed the customs inspector in Sumatra, the carbon tax or the carbon price, the carbon equivalent, I understand it's not about carbon. I did actually understand your point. Uh, the problem with HFCs is that if you levy, let's say that you thought that, and I'm in favor, let's be clear, I'm in favor of a carbon tax. I just don't think it's a magic wand that's going to solve all problems. And I think it's particularly good because it's a hell of a good way to pay for a government. And it's a hell of a good way to finance the investments in things like reforesting mangroves that we need to do. But there are lots of problems uh, in the climate world that have a failure to price carbon equivalents is a market failure, but it's not the only market failure. There are other market failures, and Mike and I think we have to address them all. So I'm, we, we talk about it in the book, and I'm totally in favor of it. And in fact, I think we will, where we'll need it, where it will really be important, is to make sure that when people operate steel mills in 2030, they operate those steel mills really efficiently. Because those are very big emitters of carbon, and they're price sensitive their investments. So a carbon tax will have a huge effect in the industrial sector, probably larger than it will have in other sectors. But I'm in favor of it in all sectors, to be clear. Okay. Yeah, um, so uh, given that um, lots 
suits and could stall off some of the. Uh, yeah, I'm interested in um, your prognosis given the fact that lawsuits could stall uh, in, in appeals, could stall off some of the Trump administration's regressive policies, and market forces, like you're suggesting, could come into play. Um, what's your analysis of how much uh, the Trump administration could really turn back the clock before his term's up and four years or heaven forbid, eight? Hey. <laughs> Well, there are many ways to turn back the clock, and climate is only one. So I want to be very clear that this, this response is only talking about climate. Uh, CO2, he'll have almost no impact. HFCs, so far, he doesn't seem to want to have an impact because the solution to the HFC problem is owned by three American corporations. The intellectual property and the patents that will replace HFCs are owned by Dow, Honeywell, and DuPont. And so Donald Trump, of course, as we all know, is on the side of the forgotten American. He's not on the side of the corporate boardroom. But in fact, it turns out people in his administration are. Uh, where I think we will have a real problem with Trump is methane. Because a huge part of methane comes from the oil and gas industry. He is determined to give the oil and gas industry everything it wants. They like to leak for whatever reason. I think it saves them money. And unlike other areas where most of the problem is in states like, I mean, most of the emissions in the United States come from states that didn't vote for Donald Trump. Two thirds of America's GDP comes from counties that voted for Hillary Clinton. So when a climate problem is coming from economic consumption, most of it is in places where we have friends. We have friendly mayors, we have friendly governors, we have you know, friendly county commissioners. Methane is mostly produced in North Dakota, Texas, Oklahoma, Alaska, and Wyoming. That's where most of the methane in the oil and gas industry comes from. And those are going to be tough states to get state or city action in. So we're going to have a problem with methane. The good news is, unlike carbon and HFCs, which last for a long, long, long time, methane only lasts for 16 years. So we can catch up on methane when we replace the man in the White House at the next opportunity, which I want to tell you, I think it's very important that we do that. Yes. Well, first of all, from my perspective, I'm on the left side of the room. <laughs> That's correct. As Einstein said, it's all relative. <laughs> I, I like your analysis. I believe that innovation and market forces can make a huge difference. But I'm worried about the timing of all of this. We've got an administration in Washington that could very likely, I'm afraid to say, be in power for seven more years. It could be. And that is a, that's a possibility. You've alluded to their draconian policies. And I see the emissions, not the greenhouse gas emissions, continuing to rise. And I'm worried about a tipping point. I'm worried particularly about uh, sea level rise. I'm worried about climate refugees. I'm worried about a uh, increasing threat globally. We talk mm -hmm. mostly about the United States. Uh, India and China, although they're moving away from coal, still are building, uh, using all kinds of coal. So I guess my conclusion is we have to move rapidly on the political front. I, I like your analysis, but we've got to get in a position where we can really enable these market forces to work rapidly. Or we're in, we may be already in deep trouble. Well, I think I, I agree with your fundamental point, which is it's all about acceleration. I mean, that's why I made the point I made at the beginning, that the media keep focusing on where we are, we're cooked. Or maybe I didn't make it, maybe this was in a conversation. I think I didn't actually say this. So one of the problems we have is, if you look at where we are, 57 gigatons of CO2E equivalents every year, we're cooked. So that's the value. Now you say, well, what about momentum? How fast are we moving? Well, actually, right now we're moving about flat. Global emissions are staying at about 57 million gigatons, 57 gigatons a year. That's not very reassuring. But you have to look, and that's the first derivative. 
Now you have to look at the second derivative, which is acceleration. What was happening five years ago? Emissions were going up. What's happening now? Emissions are flat. What's the second derivative? And that says emissions are going to start going down. We need it to go down faster. I also think we make a mistake if we set as our goal no sea level rise, no increase in abnormal weather events. That's not, we're not going to get there. We might get back there in 100 years. We may be able to get sea level back where it was, but it's going to take us 100 years. And it's not terribly likely. But what we need to worry about is a serious unraveling of the systems on which we depend. And yes, it is possible that five years ago we passed some threshold that no scientist knows about and that we're cooked. It's also possible that a meteor is going to land and it's possible that it will turn out that the president of North Korea is not, as I hope, saner than the president of the United States. Because that's what I'm counting on. But I think we have to go forward on the premise that those are catastrophic but unlikely scenarios. And in a likely scenario, we still have agency, we still have power, and we can still get this done. Well, the title of your book is Climate of Hope. And since the White House situation is the way it is, perhaps our hope should be in China and India. Can you comment on that part of the equation and the, all, the other countries that sure. have signed the Paris Agreement? Again, many of the countries that signed the Paris Agreement lack functioning governments. I'm not looking for a lot of climate leadership from Myanmar. Oh, oh, wait. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are very fortunate in that the two countries with the largest populations in the world, two of the four largest carbon emitters in the world, happen to have two qualities that make them very good people to have in the world right now. One, they are relatively competently governed at the moment. So they can actually do the things that are in their own self-interest. I mean, the government of Myanmar can't do what it's in their own self-interest. I mean, my, so my message is, this is good for people. It's good for governments. That doesn't help much in Somalia. But in India and China, that helps a lot. The second thing is, neither India nor China is a petropower. Neither of them is a major producer of oil. They therefore both have powerful self-interested reasons for wanting to stop using fossil fuels because they have to pay other people for their fossil fuels. And they both have a lot of wind and a lot of sun. So we are offering them a fuel they have a lot of as a replacement for a fuel they have to pay a lot for. And they both are rather mercantile economies and they find that a relatively attractive proposition. And they are both moving unbelievably fast. Uh, a year ago, no, no, wait, 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 let me think, because I was in, um, yeah, it was here, a year ago, the energy minister of India made a speech in which he tossed out this lofty goal. It had no actual substance in government policy. He said, oh, by 2030, all of our cars and trucks should be electrified. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> whoa, <laughs> that's so little implausible, Mr. Goyal. About two months later, some friends of mine, I happen to have a fairly substantial relationship with India, so I can't tell these kinds of stories about other places, but I can't tell them about India. A friend of mine called me up and said, nobody's taking Goyal seriously. I said, yeah, I can understand that. <laughs> and he wants to be taken seriously. So he wants to get a bunch of, he wants to have a session in New Delhi. And he's gotten the prime minister to agree that he can have a high level session, a summit to actually think about how we actually do this. And so a group of foundations here in the Bay Area put up about $200,000, which is not very much money to organize this symposium in New Delhi about how India could do it. 
and four or five cabinet ministers showed up. And they all sort of walked around the stage and tried to show how they were going to be tougher on the oil industry than the other guy, because that was the politics of the moment. Seven months later, the government of India announced that from now on, it will not, it, the government itself, which is a major economic actor, because India is a somewhat socialist economy, uh, it will no longer produce any combustion-powered vehicles after four years. They put out a big tender and they said, who's going to provide us with our electric cars? And one of the Indian OEMs bid and won. Everybody actually thinks it's going to happen. It's totally mind-boggling. I mean, I have to tell you, it's like totally mind-boggling. It's not about climate. It's about oil imports, and it's about they want to own some piece of technology. They're really angry that the Chinese own solar panels. Because they have more sun, and they think we should have owned solar panels. I mean, they're, they're a little prickly. They're a little prickly. Uh, we should have owned solar panels. And they want to own the batteries that go with the cars. It's about the batteries as much as it's about the cars, because they want to own electricity storage. So they're going to roll. And I do not believe that those huge, enormous Chinese corporations, which last year produce 150,000 electric buses. I do not believe those enormous Chinese corporations are just going to say, oh, the Indians can have it. I think the race is on. And we're not even in it. That's the price we actually pay for Donald Trump. The price we actually pay for Donald Trump is not emissions. It's stagnation. After Donald Trump goes back to liquidating his hotels, which I hope is what he has to do when he's finished. <laughs> but California needs to lead on methane. So having a, and nobody understands it, nobody's speaking for it. So if you made the oil producers in the Central Valley, if they, if they have to clean up their methane, they have to clean up all the other stuff they put out. The cleaning up methane brings everything else with it. So go after methane if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if climate justice is your goal. And it's also the place where California is actually the one place where we could make serious progress that the rest of the country could copy. Great. Okay, that was it. Carl.